Arxan is now digital.ai. Join us at our booth in the virtual expo hall to learn how our app protection, white box cryptography, and threat analytics solutions can help you stay ahead of the evolving threat landscape. Hello and welcome everyone. And thank you for registering for the OWASP Global AppSec 2020 and for joining our session on understanding the weakest link in the hood, the EOL software and a journey to secure it. Uh, before we begin, let me introduce myself. My name is Anupreeta and I work as an application security SME for J2 Global. I also lead Women of Security, that is WUSEC, New Jersey chapter and currently serving as a Director of Security Awareness for Protect Us Kids Foundation. So I introduced, uh, I, got in, I was introduced to security uh, domain back in 2014, and it instantly became my passion, uh, maybe because of my inherent observant nature or a detective nature. And from then, um, I started learning new skills and uh, being in the security domain, talking to a lot of people, uh, you know, in the, in the security domain itself. Uh, and that was about myself. Um, to move forward with the talk, let's get started. So talking about end of life software or outdated software, not knowing when and how to transform from one system to another can be both confusing and stressful. And this is why we are here today. Our today's talk is focused on understanding the weakest link, yes, you're right, the end of life software, and the various strategies to identify and secure it. Now, moving forward, we'll see the end of life philosophy to understand how this philosophy gets to where we are today, because it's, it's not what just happened yesterday or today, it's been happening something, it's been happening and been going around for a long time, and the journey is very important to understand. Um, okay. And in any journey, it is important to understand your current situation, your current position, and the risk and threats associated with it. Then at the end, we will see various prevention and mitigation strategies that will help you uh, secure your end of life software. So let's move forward understanding the end of life philosophy. Um, as we have seen, you know, quite a lot of evolution starting from 70s and 80s of all the mainframes, then evolution of many computers, then PCs came along, and then servers, networks, and then SharePoint. Uh, begin to evolve, which somewhat, you know, affected or impacted what where we are today. And when we talk about end of life, and when we talk about things like cloud, or laptops, tablets, and iPhones, and apps, this is going on. This is going on for quite a while now, and it it's not that it started like ten years ago or maybe twenty years ago. It's way, it has started on its ongoing evolution since the time it started way back then. And it leads to, uh, it leads us to the point uh, and the concepts that we need to know. The very first concept is that software change is inevitable and it is inevitable with each advancement of hardware. When we talk about advancement, we also talk about the interconnectivity between software, interconnectivity between software and hardware. And if that advancement with that hardware fails, then it directly impacts the software itself. Now we'll see how software has become a very important thing uh, when making an important business decisions. Now, if you want to compare or if you want to, if you want your um, company to be unique, technology or software is the one that will make you different or make you unique from the rest of the companies. So, 
some delay. Okay, so I need to do the, the second point again. Okay. Is it okay? Yep. Um, the second point uh, uh, for the, this uh, slide is very important one that nowadays what we are seeing is that software is the key in making important business decisions. Um, and what type of technology is used to help companies? Um, and okay, again, the second point. Okay. Um, and the second point is that nowadays software has become the key in making important business decisions. Um, and hardware has just become the commodity. When we talk about differentiating your business with the rest, we also talk about, or we mainly talk about what the software that you're trying to offer to your customers. It is very important and it differentiates uh, your company and makes it unique. Whereas uh, when we talk about the hardware, the best example for this would be um, our phones and laptops. According to the research, we tend to change um, our electronics once in every three to five years, or some electronics may be changed in, um, you know, maybe me, or they can survive more than that. Now, if you calculate that, the rate of change is between, um, between three to eight years approximately, and we don't even think about changing the, the, the hardware or maybe um, you know, the, the, the phones or the laptops or electronics um, if they are working fine, if we are installing, um, if we are regularly installing the, the softwares and we are keeping it patched and if they are working fine. So the changes, what really changes is the software when it's kept up to date and the latest updates with security patches. Coming to the third point, a good software is very hard to build because, because of the number of reasons. Um, there can be, you know, uh, there can be a lot of efforts that, that uh, companies put while understanding the requirement behind that software or what the, the customers exactly need when company, talk, company talks about the good software. And this process, this entire process takes too long and it obviously costs too much. And most of the times, um, the softwares fail to perform as expected because there can be a number of reasons because the, the, the research has not done properly. There can be budgetary issues as well as the resource issues. If we compare the cost of software versus cost of hardware, then the cost of commodity and its total cost has dropped dram dramatically over the years now. Talking about the last point, the rate of change in technology and software is brutal and forgiving. This is because um, the rate of change in technology, especially interdependency and its outdated if that's okay, I need to um, redo this. Uh, the rate of change in technology and software has become brutal. As you see, the, the software keeps coming in the market. And if the software that your company is using has a lot of interdependencies with other softwares, and if that software is going in the uh, end of life phase, it becomes challenging for the company to migrate or to migrate to other software or replace or upgrade that software with some other uh, available software in the market. And that is the reason um, it is very difficult to keep pace with the changing technology. Now, moving forward uh, with understanding what end of life really means is, um, especially when you talk about companies who are running um, the softwares from last 10 to 20 years. 
Uh, so to answer this, um, I would like to go a bit back and understand um, and let you, um, um, I, I need to redo this. Okay, sorry. Um, now, um, let's move forward and understand what does this end of life really means, especially uh, when we talk about businesses which are running uh, systems or software um, from last uh, from past 10 to 15 years. To answer this, every product has a life cycle and that begins when the software is released and it ends when the developer or the vendor decides to stop creating software updates or security patches. This transition is quite common in the tech industry and is also known as software development life cycle or um, in short as SDLC. So when the software um, goes into the out of date phase or uh, the decline phase, there are some cases um, or some things that might happen. The first uh, one is the developer or the manufacturer no longer support the product. If it's still offered by the original developer or the manufacturer, then it will be a paid support that can even, uh, which can even be uh, pay per hour support. The second one is the end of life software will no longer get updated to new problems. So if there is any security vulnerabilities um, are discovered, they are not fixed and may leave your computer, your network, or your company vulnerable to cyber attacks. We will see uh, more on the cyber attacks later part in the presentation. Uh, the third one is the end of life. Um, the third one is the end of life uh, that will no longer have replacement parts manufactured. So it may be possible that there could be access inventory um, for a few years after the uh, end of life. And however, once the parts are run, parts, once the parts run out, you may have no options for repair through the manufacturer. And that's what really end of life means. Moving to the next slide. Uh, now that we have seen the philosophy of um, and the definition of end of life, let's check how to identify uh, your current state um, with the end of life software. Now, these are the questions that you must be aware of uh, because you were possibly heavily involved um, at the time of purchasing your software uh, for, the, for your company or you must have inherited these situations and could be dealing with um, the things that say five years, uh, that, are, that must be five years older or 10 years older, or maybe older than that. But it's really important for you to understand these things um, when we talk about understanding your current state with end of life system. Uh, the first thing is that um, understanding the latest or the current version um, of the product that is heavily utilized within your organization. The second one is, what is the current version? Uh, when was the current version that was implemented? Uh, and the third one is, the next is, how customized your solution is. Now, when we talk about customization, if your customer, if your, um, sorry, I need to do this again. Okay, sorry. Um, I'll, I'll start from the beginning uh, from, for this slide. Okay, so um, when we talk about end of life, there is a possibility that you were heavily involved at the time of purchasing your software uh, for your company uh, or some of you might have inherited these situations and you could be dealing with, the, with these things from say last five years, 10 years, or maybe longer than that. But it's really important for you to know these things because they all have an impact later down the road uh, while taking decisions for your company. So for the software, first thing you need to know is that what the latest release or current version 
uh, of the product that is being utilized by your company? When was that version implemented? And how customized the solution is? The more customized it is, the difficult it is or the challenging it would be for your company to migrate to some other uh, uh, solution it will be. Um, the next thing is that when we talk about vendor, vendor is something that creates the software. And they have, and while creating it, they have all the release and up, software release and upgrade policies written. Um, and um, I need to redo this point. Um, the next point is when we talk about vendor, a vendor is someone who creates the software. And while creating a software, they also create software release and upgrade policies for that implemented solution. Now, do you know that what's the specific current application and how your current version will be supported by the vendor? Um, I think I'm going to do this again. I am so sorry. Okay. Uh, the, the, the next point is, when we talk about the software vendor, a software vendor is someone who creates the software. And while creating a software, it also they also document a software release and upgrade policies for the implemented solution. Now, your, if you want to understand your current state with end of life system, it is very important for you to know the, the, the release and upgrade policy details and implementation, implementation details specifically for your application. It also documents the, the currently implemented solution uh, support details. Um, and it is very important when taking decision about your end of life system. Another important point is that, and you need to know is um, if your company is using a niche software. This is very important to understand because not all companies are mainstream businesses. The solution that you're trying to sell, the solution that they are trying to sell, maybe because someone had invested time and effort into and that no longer being supported and they have just decided to, to maintain that whatever or uh, maintain whatever they have or some niche vendors might have not even might have might might not even have necessary financial depth, um, resources or capacity to support a long term investment. Um, in this case, it is it is definite that your company is running at some serious risks of the vendors not being supportive enough um, in the incidences when something is broken and you need to fix them. Uh, you need to fix it um, or implement it before the deadline. Coming to the next slide. Now that we have seen uh, ways you can uh, ways to identify your current state with the end of life software, let's move forward and understand if it's right time to move on or change or upgrade with the software. The default. Um, Okay, I need to do this again. Now moving to the next slide. Uh, now that we have seen uh, ways to identify your current state with end of life software, let's move forward to understand if it's right time to move on and change or upgrade uh, with the latest software. The very first thing when you decide to move on from current software is when you receive an end of life notice from your vendor. Now, this is particularly um, when you have an on-premise solution and now the industry is moving to entirely, uh, now industry is moving entirely uh, on the cloud solutions, performance-based solutions, uh, on the cloud-based, uh, 
I need to do this first point again. Okay. The very first thing when uh, you decide to move on from your current software is when you receive an end of life notice from your vendor. This is particularly when uh, you have on-premise software and now the industry is entirely moving on cloud solutions performance based product that will change a lot of aspects um, including the hiring and the investments and whatnot. The next point is a very important one. And as we move forward with the time and technology, how are we going to find talent to support the legacy software and the businesses if people are going to retire or maybe an employee decides to move for a better opportunity so it is always a risk in keeping out of date systems running in the environment as it's just a matter of understanding what the risk is for a longer term. If you decide to be with the end of life system, you are just thinking about the short term goals of um, not having to decide what the workforce or what the budgetary issues are. Then moving to another point, these things also apply while retaining your employees um, when understanding what the impact of current technology will be on your workforce. Today's employees expect dynamic and real-time access to any location, especially in the current situation where everyone is working remotely and need access to the real-time data and devices. With an outdated technology, this process becomes difficult and that is where it fails to meet the user functionality experience and often becomes a cause of frustration. Okay, so let's move forward um, on the next slide, understanding the risk factors associated with end of life software. Now, uh, well, you can still use the end of life um, after its expiration, you could put your company to a broad range of risks. That includes, first is compliance. If you store sensitive data on end of life software, you may, be not, you may not be a compliant. Uh, okay, I need to do the first point again. Okay, uh, the first one is compliance. If you store sensitive data on end of life software, you may be running a non-compliant system and again, first point. Okay. Uh, the very first point is the compliance. If you store sensitive data on end of life software, you may not be compliant with the applicable laws and regulations, um, including HIPAA, SOX and PCI. The another one is lawsuits. Another one is lawsuits. Keeping sensitive data such as customers PII or PHI within software that has reached its end of life is unsafe because it's vulnerable to cyber attacks as end of life system is the weakest link in, your, in the company's environment. And if any company experiences data breach that compromises um, their customer's data, personal information, it could face legal issues big fines, as well as a company shutdown. The next one is no security patches and upgrades. Because end of life software no longer receives bug fixes and security upgrades, your company's security can be totally compromised. Um, if hackers and you know, competitors can easily infiltrate your, your software, using various malwares or to steal sensitive information. The next one is higher operational cost. As your company technology, as, as your company's technology becomes outdated, the cost of maintaining um, is increased. Um, okay, I need to do this at the point again. Yeah. Um, higher uh, operational cost. As a company's technology becomes outdated, the cost of maintaining increases that can quickly become a burden to your company. 
This is especially um, true when it comes to the current situation where companies are more prone to um, keeping their budget uh, budget tight as well as um, reducing, pr trying to reduce um, the, the, the over ex uh, expenses. So um, the support, the extended support is not cheap, especially customers who may want to apply uh, for the, uh, these patches to multiple PCs um, and devices. They are even more expensive when you talk about uh, the professional and the enterprise versions. Uh, the next point is reduced performance and productivity. As you know, an outdated software are slowly deteriorates um, over the time and it doesn't perform as efficiently um, as before, it reduces the productivity and puts your company at a risk of losing sensitive data or incurring costly shutdowns um, and downtimes. Another uh, point is risk of hackers, malwares, and APTs. Um, as we saw earlier, software that no longer receives security upgrades and patches is the weakest link um, and can become target of hackers, malwares, and advanced persistent threats. Of course, we will see that. Um, the, of course, we will see this um, in security threats later in the slides. So now that we have seen um, end of life software, uh, let's check some of the software that made headlines in 2020 uh, in the tech world. The first one is Microsoft Windows 7. Microsoft announced that the Windows 7 operating system will no longer be supported after January 14th this year, and anyone wishing to retain their Windows 7 platform will require to pay a premium uh, for each device um, to continue receive to the security patches and upgrades and support with the cost that will double every year. So according to the reports, uh, during the first year of end of life cycle, Windows 7 Pro will cost $50 per device and the enterprise will cost $25. Whereas in the next year, the cost will double and it, will, it would cost $100 uh, for the Pro version, whereas $50 for the enterprise. And in the next and the last year, it would again double with $200 for the pro version and $100 for the enterprise version per device. It's same as Python 2. Um, the Python 2 recently, uh, the Py um, I need to do this again. Uh, for the Python 2 that finally reached its end of life at the beginning of this year, um, that leaves you know, some of the companies um, in the, on the exposure who didn't plan the migration beforehand. And uh, there could be several reasons for it, um, such as, you know, um, such as companies didn't know about the end of life phase. Second can be uh, companies, um, okay, I need to do this again. Okay. Um, uh, then talking about Python 2, um, Python 2 as well finally reached its end of life at the beginning of this year. Uh, that leaves uh, the companies in the exposure who didn't plan the migration before. The reason uh, for this could be not planning the migration could vary, such as some components uh, work only on Python 2 and it's not available on Python 3. Second could be the size of code bases and dependencies is too much and it is becoming a challenge for for the companies to migrate to another solution or to upgrade to the to python 3 or companies are still in the phase of learning python 3 skills and the fourth reason can be that the companies are not even aware that python 2 has become an outdated version and the and security updates are on dead halt. 
So these end of life um, software might be a victim um, to some, secure, some serious security threats. And that is true for all the uh, softwares that went to end of life state um, this year. Um, I think I would need to do again, um, but let me just check which one. Okay, uh, I'll again start with Python 2. Okay, uh, talking about Python 2, um, Python 2 as well finally reached its end of life at the beginning of this year. That leaves us. That leaves the company, uh, some companies, uh, on the exposure of the security threats because there are many companies that didn't plan the migration before um, before it went um, outdated, and there could be different reasons for it. Uh, it can be due to um, that the components that Python two offered is not offered in Python three. This, there can be reasons such as um, the code base and dependencies are so um, intervened that it is, it, it's becoming a challenging for the companies to migrate to some other solution or to the latest version of, uh, uh, of Python. There can be a reason such as um, some companies are even um, learning, are currently learning the, the you know, in the learning phase of Python 3. And maybe some companies are not even aware that the system or the, the software has become out of date. And now, uh, and, and that is true for all the, um, all the softwares listed here. Um, and now it's the security updates are on dead halt. Uh, these running end of life software might be a victim to some serious security threats even more than what it was in previous phase of its life cycle. And now let's check, uh, let's check out all the possible security threats with my co-speaker and friend Asta. And thank you again for joining our today's session and stay safe. Thank you, Anuprita. Hi, everyone. This is Asta Sani. Before we move forward with this session, let me briefly introduce myself to you all. So, my name is Asta Sani. I'm the lead cybersecurity instructor at Flatiron School. Along with my regular job, I have recently started a small initiative known as Cyber Preserve. Here in Cyber Preserve, we are working as an, uh, we are providing some cybersecurity mentorship program, which are low cost professionals who want to transition their career into cybersecurity. My mentorship program is free for the college students. Along with this mentorship program, coming back to communities, I'm the lead of New York chapter for InfoSec Girls and an active member of OVASP NYC chapter, along with women in AppSec. So as Anuprita well described and explained about the philosophy, concept, and risk around EOL softwares, let's now discuss some of the possible security threats to the EOL softwares and what should be the best possible prevention and mitigation strategies. Possible security threats. As risks are associated with EOL softwares, and if you can see this possible paraphrase in this slide, which clearly mentioned by a blog known as Trend Micro in 2015, that while Windows XP end of life process did not precipitate any major cybersecurity related event, case study like uh, the scrutiny given as a case study and how to prevent vulnerable, like, vulnerabilities. For example, even though what they're trying to mention here is, even though in 2015, Windows XP had become an end of life software and there was no possible known cybersecurity threat, little did we know that in future when 2017 hit, cyber threat actors, they utilize this vulnerability, one of the vulnerabilities in Windows XP operating system and leverage that vulnerability in the very well-known WannaCry ransomware in 2017. Now, the good point and to pay here as an attention is that even though you will see that some of the 
some of these end of life softwares they have not yet reported any possible security threats we never know in future how threat actors hacker nation state actors can leverage these end of life softwares vulnerabilities into a possible threat and this possible threat associated with vulnerability can lead to a great risk rating and we all know risk vulnerability and threat they are all well related to each other so if there is a risk around end of life softwares there can be a possible vulnerabilities around these softwares in the current time or in the future time which can be easily exploitable by the threat actors in future now now coming to the some security threats these particular cyber security threats they can go from minor version to a major version minor means like virus worms trojan horses some kind of ddos attacks but what about some major attacks like zero day ransomware of 2017 was a major hit four days and 200000 computers were attacked it wasn't a joke it's a serious matter and that's why it becomes really important for us to cater these end of life softwares very very seriously we have seen organizations in the past even in the current like in the current times they are not upgrading they are not replacing these softwares and application reason being like their business there will be some kind of this business uh, disruption they don't want to invest certain amount of money or other possible they, their own business reasons but the point is if you are ignoring them from time to time you can be the victim of another major cyber threat due to these end of life softwares and interestingly tell me what do you think about advanced persistent threats now when i say advanced persistent threats yes just uh, okay so coming to advanced persistent threats what are your thoughts advanced persistent threats have been hitting organizations globally since early 2000 and if you notice if you have read about the 2013 mandiant report about apt1 attacks it clearly mentioned that the threat actors they utilized one of these tactic like in their tactic techniques and procedures they utilize vulnerabilities from eol softwares and this is not a joke because apt1 attack which was an advanced persistent threat actually remained in network for certain victim systems for more than an year and that was the average amount of time and interestingly if you do not know what are apts in case of apts the threat actors they utilize multiple tactics techniques and procedures to attack a target and those attacks are not just limited to one organization two organization but their scope is expanded to a whole nation these advanced persistent threats they have been supposedly they have been found out that they are based on nation state attacks they are sponsored by states and governments and their aim is not only to impact one organization or state but may majorly attack them from the basis of either economically affecting them or like bringing their reputation down so it it has major major impacts and if we keep our eyes on some median values of dwell time of threat actors in 2013 around in 2013 the dwell time which is the average time an attacker remains in the network undetected in the in, from the concept of advanced persistent threats that dwell time is at that time around 2013 was around 197 days even though our cyber security professionals we we as professionals we are becoming smart we are working hard we are we are getting new techniques we are increasing our controls we are increasing defense in depth but the point is we have got this number down to just 56 still 56 56 days an attacker is in your network undetected and if the reason for that attacker being in your network is an end of life software risk and vulnerability then man the vulnerability was in front of you the risk was in front of you but you didn't actually upgrade it patch them and implemented controls at that time that's why it reached that level and 
these topics, especially these advanced threats, it's it's a situation of panic and fear only. Because as far as I know, all of us as professionals, all of all like currently, all organizations they have their in-house security teams. Everybody investing money in security, and everybody wants to be secure. And if we are not taking care of these small things like end-of-life softwares, sorry advanced persistent threats can easily happen in future as well now some let's discuss some prevention and mitigation strategies along along or around eol softwares so how can we prevent them how we how we can take care of these eol softwares so the very important thing is in order to detect them on time patch, upgrade, or remove them, the very first thing which we can do is improve our risk assessment plan. So in our risk assessment plan and strategy, we can include detection of these EOL software so that we can calculate their risk rating for future, for future possible threats and vulnerabilities. Second is we can include some advanced automation techniques in endpoint detection softwares, the endpoint detection and response tools, which we are using like Carbon Black and other like Windows Defenders. What we can do is we can include some detection, advanced detection mechanism through which these tools can easily detect end of life softwares in our systems, applications and services so that once they are detected and alerted, we can patch or upgrade them on time. Next is inventory management. So, of course, we know inventory management is one of the major methodologies which is used in large organization in order to manage their assets. So, in inventory management tool also, we can include EOL detection. We can include these strategies for end-of-life software's detection on time so that, again, they are detected at a very initial stage of asset discovery and we can remove, either we can remove them or we can upgrade them. So, if there is a possible upgrade for these end of life softwares we can easily upgrade them but if there is no upgrade the best rule is to replace them on time even though it will require a small investment of money trust me trust me it's better than the big impact you can get from a security incident from major cyber threat now Fourth important thing which we are see, which I am seeing currently is there is an organization known as Free Software Foundation. They are coming up with good, really. So this is a nonprofit organization, which is Free Software. And what they are doing, what this foundation is doing, they are creating campaigns around end of life softwares and what kind of campaigns they have started. Recently, we know in 2020 January, Windows, Windows 7 became uh, end of life software. So they have started this initiative where they are requesting to change like they are requesting microsoft to change windows 7 from end of life to a free software once it becomes a free or open source software we can easily patch them and upgrade them throughout the life cycle and they become easy to manage so one of the mitigation strategy or prevention strategy is to make these end of life softwares as free softwares so that they are they are upgrade their patching their upgrade their functionality can be enhanced throughout life now Next important thing is when we are implementing these mitigation strategies and prevention techniques, why not implement them with one of the good possible business methodology? PDCA, which is plan, do, check, act, is one of the business methodology used in the normal, normal business operations like IT operations, account operations, financial operations. So it is a very good with business methodology skill or technique which is used by a lot of organizations. It's proactive. It's a continuous learning program. So PDCA, through PDCA, we are continually learning and improving. So of course, when I say we have to implement some prevention and mitigation strategy, of course, we know in future when new kind of EOL softwares will come, we would have to include, we will have to include more prevention and mitigation strategies. So when we know we have to improve from time to time, why not implement these mitigation and prevention strategies with the continual learning program? So in PDCA, for example, how we can implement PDCA in mitigation and prevention strategies of EOL software is in your plan stage. So PDCA, the P in the PDCA PDCA is the plan. So in the plan stage, what you can do is include EOL software risk assessment as part of organization's risk assessment plan. So if EOL softwares 
and their detection their detection their mitigation is part of your risk assessment plan you can easily assess them at your risk assessment like during risk assessment you can assess their risk ratings in the do part what you can do is when we have completed the risk assessment we we can decide on the necessary steps we we have to take for these end of life softwares when we know the necessary steps we can take so we'll implement those strategies either upgradation or replacement once we do that we do a check check is always done to verify what actions we have performed on our planning and do techniques is it right or not do we need to make any enhancement on further changes or validations and repeat means we'll repeat this process and in this process of pdca each time each time when a particular implementation is done we learn from time to time so for example certain technique was not for example a certain strategy for eul software mitigation and prevention was not included earlier here now we have encountered a situation through one of the new eel software what we can do is we can include that new technique in our pdca uh, methodology and improve from time to time next along with pdca is swot analysis now what happen in case of swot analysis swot analysis again is an important implementation strategy it's a powerful technique which reflects not only the strengths and opportunity to an organization but it also require it also reflects boldly about the weaknesses and threats so how we can utilize swot analysis for prevention and mitigation of eul softwares so now when the organization knows what are the strength for example if an organization is implementing swot analysis from cyber security point of view or security structure point of view first of all what are the strength of the organization what are what are the good security controls implementation tools application in place what are the future opportunities for the organization like are we are we going to install some new tools uh, from security point of view hire more professionals and when coming to weakness we can find out along with the normal vulnerabilities in our application system and services we can find out vulnerabilities through end of life softwares and we can then associate those vulnerabilities with future risk and threats and based on that we will not be like based on the swot analysis we will not be just focusing on the strength and opportunity of an organization we'll be focusing on the weaknesses and threats as well and when we will focus on the weaknesses and threats we will be able to view them and not ignore them so swot analysis actually make you boldly see the actually real structure of your organization so if you're trying to ignore if you're trying to run away from the weaknesses and threats they'll make you feel like no you have to face it you have to work on it now what additional swot analysis can help and pdca can help us is for example we reach a situation where we detected some end of life softwares and we are now thinking what to do with them e either to upgrade them or invest some money get some new softwares in place so what is the best strategy for our organization will all depend on our business environment whatever is the business requirement according to that we'll take necessary decision and pdca and swot analysis like techniques better than them i cannot see right now like swot is like proactive pdca is continuous learning and through them looking at the picture of the current situation of your organization you can take good actions you can take better mitigation and prevention strategies for the eul softwares now we very well know your applications are as good as your softwares your applications your services they are doing their best they are giving their best until and unless they are updated if they are not updated dude you are under threat you are under risk you are under vulnerabilities that's why it's important for organizations to upgrade to up to patch upgrade replace end of life and our, our, our other outdated softwares and once you do that it be like 
you are taking one step ahead actually of the attacker because once you protect and you implement all security controls this is a very important statement even though your organization is investing good amount of money in cyber security hiring professionals implementing security tools but you, when your organization is not patching software's application and services which are required they are under risk they are under vulnerability and they are under threat so that's why always remember upgrading patching and replacing according to your business requirement and here is a list of upcoming eol dates for some popular softwares which organizations can utilize for their reference they can leverage this list and find out if they they themselves are using any possible future end of life softwares so that they can start their planning implementation and prevention strategy from this stage only so here are some references for our slides today and thank you so much guys for attending our session today if you want to reach out to us so you can reach out to me and anuprita through linkedin and twitter and to me you can reach out to me through my website only which is cyberpreserve.com thank you so much for your time today and we hope that you like our session today thank you